You know, enjoy, if you're a writer, telling yourself the story you're writing, dividing yourself into two, and quite self-consciously thinking of half of yourself as the writer and the other half of yourself as the reader. That's very important for when you go back over stuff, but it's equally important to keep yourself engaged with the work and keep the excitement and frisson that should be attendant upon it in time for the grand reveal. And of course, the same could be true of a painting or, or any other kind of work that you do uh, in isolation in that sense. For my own part, I tend to eschew works of creativity that are too powerful when I'm actually trying to be creative myself. I like to starve myself of other people's creativity. In part, and this is to go right back to the perspiration point, in part because my conception of the creative life is so much to do with discipline and quite hard work. So it's a sort of creative purder. Uh, and I don't want to see, you know, to me, trying to get other people to suspend disbelief in, in my creative ideas is like being a seal with a ball balanced on its nose. At the end of a hard day of ball balancing in the circus, you don't really want to see some other poor seal doing the same thing. So I've tended not to read, for example, fiction and certainly not fiction of the kind that i want to write while i'm actually engaged in in writing fiction but that my uh purda can be uh, even more extreme than that i'm going to take questions in a minute but uh so if you've got any questions uh i think there's there's four on the q a so uh i i'd welcome some more i can probably get to, to some more uh what i would say is that I think all of this stuff does amount to creating your own purpose-built technology of creativity, creative technology, taking the combinatorial idea, buttressing it with sound working practices, uh, locking it into a structure of discipline uh, that includes the discipline of self-isolation, isolation from other uh, creative influences and sources. Uh, and then what is the result of that? Well, interestingly, you don't hear about a lot of this in relation to creativity. You hear mostly people talk about it in relation to doing things that we naturally think of as automatic processes. So we're all familiar with the idea, in that case, of a flow state. Those of you who drive cars and have been driving them for some years will know that it's perfectly possible to get into a car, drive right across a crowded town or a section of a city and have almost no memory of how you got there. You are in the flow state of driving. You know how to do that. But what might it be like to be in the flow state of creativity? Okay. Well, a verbal performer, an, uh, an actor, uh, you know, might well uh be able to tell you because when an actor for example is perhaps giving hamlet's famous soliloquy uh he's able or she's able if it's a, a gender blind or sex blind casting is is able to bend color the words project them differently give them a different sense maybe discover new senses in shakespeare uh, and in that soliloquy, just in the act of sending those words out into the darkened theatre, that's an unfortunate choice uh, of creative uh, activities in our current parlous situation, but there it is. Uh, and we can think of, of then that idea of the flow going into all our creative pursuits. It must be, uh, you know, ceramicists, particularly if they're actually spinning pots or something like working on a wheel must feel a possibility to change and mutate the substance back to eric gill and his chipping uh, a, a three-dimensional statue or or you know bass relief out of a chunk of rock certainly you know i give a lot of public readings of my own work i speak in public quite a lot for a living uh, and having done it for many many years and maybe I've done a little bit of it in this talk that I've just delivered to you. I've been able to add new things. I've been able to twist or bend or alter what I'm saying actually in the flow of saying it. Uh, and I think that kind of flow state creativity is what we're aiming for. 
uh, because when you're in the flow state, you've in a sense incorporated all of these disciplines uh, and they become tacit, they become tacit skills. Whereas the high order executive function is in play still, it can move around, it has the leisure to actually alter the production of the word stream in my own case, as I'm actually working on it. And for me, uh, all of the things I've been talking about lead up in stages. All of these creative uh, disciplines lead up in turn to hopefully the production. You know, I said I'm not interested in uh, the goal-driven production of work. I'm interested in liberty. But for me, the freedom is the whole activity. It perpetuates, it creates its own sense of freedom. The freedom is also a byproduct of that tacit state of being tacitly skilled state of being in your own creative stream and making sense of the world uh, my sensibilities are open to the world you know again marshall McLuhan, the canadian philosopher said the artist is an expert in sense perception so all of these exercises all of these modes of being are about enhancing senses enhancing your perception you know i, I write at the top of uh, you know here's a page of the last novel I write at the top of everything when I'm working. I write, uh, you know, are there going to be pop references? Are there going to be sounds? Are there going to be colours in this? Are they going to be, you know, because all too often you'll you'll read something written that you don't like, and one of the things you'll recognise it has no sensorium embodied in the text. It's uncreative in that sense. The characters don't live. They're disembodied. They don't have bodies often. You know, one of the ways into thinking about characters, of course, is to think about their bodies and, and think about their emotions and live that embodiment in those emotions. I realize I've gone on as usual. I'm going to answer a few questions which have gratifyingly gone up since I asked for them to 31. Neil has asked a question, your audiobook listener, your thorough sticky note planning is well known, but have you ever found yourself rejecting planning due to the drive of the plot or character? And he very kindly enjoyed the phone on the audio book. Good question, Neil. Uh, yeah, you, you've in a sense arrived at the, the same point the talk has. The rejection comes when you're in the flow. But you cannot reject unless you're in the flow. It's another form of saying, you know, you can't break the rules unless you know them. Your self-created rules of creativity allow you to overmaster them and then as it were, to take the extra creative leap. So you're quite right, but the two exist in equipoise or in counterpoint. You have to have that phenomenal uh, technology to begin with. Will, uh, says Jamie, can you address the laughable prevailing view that creativity is always good and always expresses the same set of values? Isn't creativity in itself absolutely amoral? Surely devising a new method of torture plotting a bank heist or even constructing a death camp involves a lot of creativity. Absolutely, Jamie, you speak to my condition. And of course, to dear old Franz Kafka's story uh, in the penal colony, in which the ghastly official of the penal colony has created a machine that kills its victims by inscribing physically and tattooing or clawing their uh, crime, their sentence on the skin of their back. Uh, what could be more creative than that? Um, I'm just, you know, moving down here. So yeah, creativity, absolutely amoral in that way. And the combinatorial thing will lead you into that amoral defile because, you know, you'll have, you know, so you'll have a genitals on, on one of the wheels spinning around and it'll come up with elephant on the other thing you think shall i write something about having sex with an elephant you know you think oh, it's a bit heavy or a bit weird but in a sense the rights of the imagination have taken you there so you have to consider it um do i think creativity is something that can be taught somebody uh that's from mark beverly i'm dubious about it i i, I tend to teach as it were the technology of creation uh I think, I mean, again, I mean, it's a paradoxical thing. I've said I'm not that hot on creative writing. I think people are aiming in the wrong direction because they tend to approach it instrumentally. Uh, I think 
I, I, I have to say, I rarely have seen somebody fail in realizing some of this creative autonomy, some of this sense of liberty, and some of this sense of satisfaction of looking back on something they've made uh, and sensing satisfaction that they've made it if they've followed my rules for developing their own technology of creativity. So maybe I believe it can be taught to that extent. Um, yes, and then there's a question about influence. I, I think I have addressed that. It never works, you know, you, you cannot buck the trend of your influence. I think when we acknowledge that, we see that all artistic endeavors are much more akin to a palimpsest than they are some you know, boldly going where no one's creatively gone before. It is a collective effort. It is intertextuality or interplatology if you're a ceramicist. Uh, any tips? Now, this is a question I like. Any tips for when the head is getting in the way with negative talk? Yes, good question from Emma Pierce. Uh, top question. The answer is simply turn the volume down of the negativity. I, the number of times I've said this to Tyro creative people of all sorts, it's never going to go away. The captious, carping voices saying, you're useless, who are you? You're pretentious, what right have you to do this? You have no fresh eyes. They're never going to go away. They're never going to go away. James Joyce was hearing those captious voices on his deathbed. So you must learn to live with them. I'm not going to come out with the old canard that everybody can be creative if they want, but actually they can. Creativity is a mode of being in the world. It's not focused on the particular works, but the way of being creative in the world uh, is to silence those captious voices, which are the voices of unreflective habit. Um, okay, dreams. Good question. Did dreams ever influence? Did you sleep with an notebook? Absolutely. Yes, and when I was wackier and younger, I believed that my dream life, I still slightly believe this actually, was particularly enhanced. I tried all sorts of things. I shaved my head because, you know, I taught myself to lucid dream, uh, which is possible uh, as a hypnotic post-suggestion. So you come to it conscious in your dream and can manipulate it. I wore hats. I shaved my head when I slept. I left a voice-activated tape recorder by my bed when I was sleeping alone in the hope that any uh, chance ejaculations of a verbal kind would be caught during the night. Uh, all of the above. Uh, I think that, that dreams are important. And, and, and why should Freudians have them? After all, their account of the unconscious is not necessarily correct. Um, and then I think I've got one, probably time for one further question here. And I'm sorry, because having asked for questions, I've now see I've got 40 here uh, and I feel a little bit guilty because I, I, I'd like to answer them all. If you do have a burning question, you can always contact me via my website, which is will-self.com. And if you say that you were part of the How To Academy thing and you had a question I didn't have time to answer, uh, I'll do my best to answer it for you. Um, so an apposite or timely final question here. Uh, have I found the lockdown helpful with creativity? Hmm, good question. Well, yes, I, I, I found it helpful in the sense that, of course, it's given me. I've been in the shield category because I have an underlying medical condition. So I've been pretty isolated uh, for, since uh, early March. Uh, and, you know, that, that's what I think is a creative mode, <laughs> being withdrawn from society. Uh, I don't really do social media myself in any direct way, so that's not a form of engagement for me. So I have been quite nicely isolated. I've had lots of opportunities for plein air composition, since I can only, as it were, go out alone and with a member of my immediate family and take notes in the local park. Uh, so all of that has been good. What it hasn't been good for is the sustained concentration that's necessary to develop that kind of technology of creativity, that full-blown flow state. That's been very difficult to achieve. We're in a, a rapid and fast developing situation, as I'm sure we're all aware. Uh, and, you know, it's always 
uh, a bit suspect when writers in particular rush into print with, for example, their Brexit novel. I saw quite a few of my uh, peers falling victim to that canard, and I suspect those works will uh, look as anachronistic as they did once timely. Uh, and of course, that's surely got to be true of the pandemic itself. Is this the new normal? In which case, when, when is it time to start writing pandemic novels? Actually, the time to write a pandemic novel was probably about 10 years ago. Uh, so I think sustained creativity, most people have probably been finding that fairly difficult in lockdown so far. But I think if this is the new normal, who knows? Maybe with our increased isolation from one another, the, the closer attention we're going to be forced to pay to our immediate environment and the kind of quotidian uh, activities that we're engaged in, perhaps this could be the dawning of a, a new form of, of liberty and, and creativity for us all. Uh, because, to return to my rather minatory remarks at the beginning, uh, I personally believe that that's the only real form of of liberty that most of us are afforded in this uh, dirt ball of instinctive behavior that we seem to inhabit. Okay, uh, I think we may be there uh, at the end of, of the event, uh, but I'll, I'll just go on wittering a little bit until Dana comes back in uh, to finish. Uh, is it possible to apply the inspiration ideas you've mentioned to music? I hope so. I do hope so. Uh, how do you factor in family life and creativity? My children are an eternal distraction. They are an eternal distraction, but, but you know, uh, there's times when they're asleep, I hope. They sleep rather longer than us. Uh, I, I began writing when I had a young child. I got up at five and six in the morning uh, to write. Uh, and of course, they do say the funniest things. Um, thank you so much, Will, for this incredible talk. I'm sure everyone has enjoyed it. Um, and thank you, everyone at home or wherever you are um, for your questions and for joining us today. Um, Will, thank you so much again. And good evening or good day, everyone. <laughs>